Kukuma Media's Politi Yamtabi Madiba. Joining me today is one of the editors of the book, Better Choices, Professor Harun Barat and contributor Gareth Newham. The book is compiled by the Brent House Foundation. Better Choices provides an unflinching account of the extreme number of challenges that South Africa faces. In a nutshell, Harun, what do you think the book sets out to achieve and what will readers get from it? Yeah, thanks very much, Toby. I mean, so one of the things we try to do 30 years into democracy is actually try and find the space to talk about policy that did three different things. One is to actually move beyond simple analysis or detailed analysis even to actionable policy, but use the same experts, the same knowledgeable people to pursue that sort of analytical agenda. The second is to ask what we call second order policy questions. So in other words, instead of saying we need to fix ESCOM or um, as Gareth will talk about it, uh, figure out how to solve the crime problem, we want to move to second order questions, which is how do you do it? A little bit more detail than nuanced. And then the third reason for the edited volume is to almost suggest indirectly that imperfect policy reform is better than waiting for policy perfection. And that then just tries to move us slightly away from this notion of more programs, more plans, and waiting for policy perfection. And so what you'll see in the volume is a range of detailed policy options that, in fact, in some cases may be imperfect, but at least push us on this road towards trying to make better choices. And Gareth, your chapter focuses on crime and South Africa's justice system. You identified as major problems, political interference and poor leadership appointments in security and law enforcement agencies. So could you please expand on this insight? Thanks. Uh, yes, I think that in many ways is the a nub of the problem we're facing, because in many ways we've had really good policies. You're starting with as far back as 1996, the National Crime Prevention Strategy under the presidency of Nelson Mandela, which is a very inclusive strategy-making process. It had the best minds in the country from within the government and outside of government, um, and really understood the multifaceted challenge that crime and violence is in South Africa, and that we needed a, quite a broad range of stakeholders to engage with it. So out of the four key pillars of that strategy, for example, um, the criminal justice system improving their functioning was only one of the four pillars. And then subsequently, we've had many other commissions of inquiries, other strategic processes, policies and plans, all that say the right thing. But we just haven't had the implementation. And I think what we point out is that that has largely been because of political appointments at the top of the criminal justice system and state security agencies, where those individuals have largely seen their role as protecting their political party or their political faction or principles. And this became particularly to characterize the, the, the presidency of uh, former President Jacob Zuma, where the, the people weren't necessarily competent at all. Um, up until then, they'd usually get quite high level people that might be politically loyal to the ANC, but could do the job to, to run the police or to run the NPA, um, although they would not, they'd still make political decisions. It really deteriorated quite substantially in the last nine years of the Zuma administration because people that were appointed we're so far removed from having the necessary skills, capabilities, integrity to fulfill the functions of the post that they hold. And those organizations deteriorated substantially because each one of those uh, appointments, and there are many of them, um, would make a whole uh, range of other appointments in key positions, whether it's in crime intelligence, the Na in National Prosecuting Authority, the Hawks. Um, and then these organizations' capabilities started to collapse as a result of that. So yeah, the leadership issue has been uh, a key area of problem for the South African criminal justice system. And in your chapter, Haroon, you argue that the COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated many of the country's pre-existing economic vulnerabilities, with unemployment being such a major problem. So what reform could you push for to help to create more productive and equal labor markets? So in many ways, we allude to the fact um, in our chapter, again, on the analysis side, that, that it's both a long run and a short run problem, if you like. The long run problem, and we have a we have a quite a vivid graphic to show how GDP per capita in South Africa has slowed over the last sort of decade to about 1.7% per annum. And that's far below our emerging market comparators. And we've almost got this sort of, you can imagine a crocodile's mouth 
where the bottom where the bottom uh, jaw is South Africa's growth rate and the top jaw is the rest of the emerging markets. That's what's happened to us over 30 years. Uh, COVID then exacerbates that. What we suggest is a three or four key components of trying to think about employment growth in a different way. The first, which I think is already featuring in part of the discussions within the presidency is around the extensions of bargaining council agreements that currently automatically uh, are extended to non-parties to remove that, or at least to facilitate a process that allows for small businesses not always to be uh, automatically part of a bargaining council agreement between larger parties, larger employers and um, uh, dominant trade unions. That has been on the table as a key constraint on growth of small businesses and employment creation within small businesses for two decades. And, and I think that's a key area. The second, and we, we, we show this uh, in the chapter and in the informal sector chapter by other authors, Imran Velodia being the key author, that the size of South Africa's informal sector is actually relatively small compared to other uh, middle-income countries. In fact, very small. So ironically, one needs a, a set of active policies which remove the barriers to entry for the informal sector. If one thinks of the cities, uh, the key cities and, and uh, semi-urban towns in South Africa, the informal sector is hidden. That's very different to other emerging markets and middle-income countries where the informal sector is allowed to thrive. So there's a whole set of policies around removing barriers to entry for the informal sector. The third is around skills constraints. You know, the evidence, again, is very clear around skill shortages and skills constraints, yet um, immigration policies to attract skilled workers uh, makes it very, very difficult for these individuals to come into South Africa. So we, we suggest a streamlined process for skilled workers, foreign workers to come into the country. In addition, the current CETA system is very, very ineffective in aligning what we call uh, workers and firm incentives. So CETAs are spending invariably on the wrong types of skills. The final suggestion we have is for government to, which has partly been done, to look at supply side measures for firms. So that's a simple way of saying incentivize firms, not necessarily households or individuals, but firms to hire more workers. That can be through an innovative form of employment tax incentive scheme or other forms of incentives, whether it's an EPZ, uh, other forms of wage subsidies to incentivize firms to hire more workers. Um, and so those are sort of some of the coordinates of trying to unlock growth in employment, at the same time, hoping that that would in turn shift uh, the growth trajectory, the GDP trajectory onto a higher plane. And Gareth, do you think that President Cyril Ramaphosa is winning the battle to strengthen the policy and justice system and overcome the effects of state capture? Uh, the President Ramaphosa campaigned on an anti-corruption ticket and has in many different speeches and forums spoken about the need to have an independent and well-functioning well criminal justice system. And I think when we look at what he's done uh, since becoming president, there's certainly been a prioritization there. Um, you know, within two months of him being the president, there was a new head of the Hawks, a highly respected general. Uh, we've got a new national director of public prosecutions and a whole new management team there that he's appointed. We've seen bigger budgets going to the NPA. We've seen um, the same thing happening with the special investigation units, new fusion centers set up, a national security council being established. Um, and he's allowed the Zondo Commission to continue all the requests for postponements, he hasn't gone against those uh, or tried to stop them. So I think he definitely understands how important tackling corruption and improving criminal justice is for economic growth and for the country's prosperity. But I think we still have a long way to go. He does not have a background in criminal justice, in uh, issues of intelligence, and I think it's been quite slow. So, for example, the damage done to these institutions can't simply be undone just by appointing new heads. There needs to be a whole reform process in each of these institutions. For too long, they've got into a situation where they've got into decline and a kind of uh, compliance culture has set in, in the police and the NPA, um, in the Hawks, which means that they're not able to necessarily be innovative, strategic, bring in fresh new ideas and skills. 
um, because the whole culture of the organization it mitigates against that. So I think we need to see a sort of a, a more reflective, more deliberate institutional reform process underway to better understand how do we really get to see the criminal justice functioning at a level which is acceptable given the vast resources that is spent on it and that it has at its disposal. And how do you see the issue of immigration in the context of South Africa's current economic challenges, Haroon? So I think, ironically, we, not for the first time, are attempting to resolve the sort of um, scarce skill uh, um, constraint through faster or more efficient immigration of foreign workers. So, so that issue has been on the table for quite a while. I think there's an opportunity here in engagements, uh, or as the as the book chapter suggests, an opportunity here to treat it in the, with a little bit more fine tuning of the policy decisions. And what do I mean by that? Well, it turns out that there is this system, of course, right, to allow accreditation of foreign skills coming into the country. It turns out that it's actually based on what we think is a too broad uh, a category of worker. So, for example a car company wants to bring in an engineer, but they don't say they want an engineer. The car company knows that they need an electrical engineer with um, fuel experience, you know, amounting to 15 years in, say, the diesel engine. Uh, you can see I know very little about this, but in the diesel engine uh, division of the company. So when they specify that, the data system that the that government currently has says, well, okay, Company A needs an electrical engineer. There are lots of those in the country. And so they reject the application for a scarce skills visa. So there's a data inconsistency in what companies demand and need versus what government on the, on the skills side, local skill side says is available in the country. And it's, and it's that little thing in terms of resolving that data match, which I think can unlock clear opportunities for ensuring that companies do get the scarce skills they require. That's uh, the first one. And the second one, very quickly, is that entire process of moving from company needs a scarce skill to actually issuing the scarce skill visa is incredibly inefficient. So there's an efficiency and time-bound uh, resolution that is required. And I think on those two aspects, one can see some clear movement if, if uh, we proceed with implementation. And Gareth, do you think we will ever be held to account for those who organized the violence and looting in July last year after former President Jacob Zuma was arrested? Well, as at the current time, it's not clear that the people who are involved in the planning and the initial instigation are going to be held accountable. Um, we haven't seen arrests of those people. We are not seeing people facing charges of treason. Uh, we're not seeing people facing particular kinds of charges of, of the kind of crimes that would lead to, say, conspiring to commit violence and murder, for example, or destruction. Um, but that is not too surprising. I think we uh, accept that the people who planned this were people with intelligence and law enforcement skills and capabilities. And so they would have planned it in a way to avoid accountability, to make it very difficult to drill back to them. Um, once this had happened. So despite there may be many thousands of arrests, most of the people arrested were uh, charged for quite relatively petty crimes such as looting um, and destruction of property. Uh, but I think that whole July violence points out to a key challenge that we could actually solve quite easily. It is about having a national risk assessment that is not the preview of a few technocrats sitting in the state security agency and people at the top levels of the criminal justice system. Um, because it's been shown that because of this leadership challenge um, of people who are being appointed there because of their political loyalties, the ability to understand the complexity of the nature of the challenges that we're facing as a nation are limited. And they were not able to put in place the kinds of systems that would not only enable them to prevent this kind of violence from happening, but to respond adequately to it. And there are many instances, it's not just the July violence. We're talking about the construction mafia. We're talking about attacks on uh, infrastructure related to trans transport systems and mining. Um, those things just don't seem to appear anywhere as priorities in government's framework of what is a national security threat. And that is because the national security strategy is actually a classified document, which doesn't make sense. In many countries, it's not classified because the nature of these challenges is increasingly complex. New challenges are emerging like cybercrime. 
Um, and the cap capability to respond to this don't, doesn't only exist in the state. So if you have an inclusive way of understanding these challenges and bring on board a lot more capability that we have than what is available in the state, you're much more likely to then have a, a sound risk assessment and a strategy that recognizes the necessary role that others can play. And for example, when it comes to July, there were indications from the high level panel from what they're coming across and what we ourselves through our own interviews and, and research have found that people were aware that something was happening, um, but the ability to translate that into a proper response was lacking. So it happened and spread without the necessary law enforcement or intelligence um, resources being brought to bear on that. And some of the dates you present, Haroon, indicates that middle-class income earners have faced the least wage increases and even falling wages in recent years. So what do you think is driving this phenomenon? Yeah, so, so we have um, this thesis of um, what we call the missing middle, right? So if you look at wage growth rates since um, 1994, but you can take a later date up to the present across the distribution of income, wage growth has been highest at the bottom end and the top end. Um, and essentially, it's the polarized nature of uh, the South African labor market, which is uh, at the top end, there's a massive shortage of skilled workers. And as a consequence, in order to retain those scarce skills, employers pay, are paying workers more and more. And so they wage nominal wages grow faster than inflation. And so you see this real wage adjustment at the top end. So in addition, is of course the rapid growth in wages for public sector workers. And that's from about the 70th percentile onwards and not a popular opinion, but factually true unionized workers as well. The bottom end are workers that are, uh, have been supported over the years by um, and through minimum wages, um, essentially that bring up the bottom end of the distribution. So if you look at the average bargaining outcome, the unions will ensure that the bottom wage is aggressively increased and as a consequence, just to close that off, employers then sort the wage bill out by compressing the middle of the distribution. And so what you're seeing is a large number of sort of mid-level workers in most industries seeing their wages declining or not keeping uh, pace with uh, inflation or in real terms not uh, being aggressively hiked as much as top-end workers. There's also... In the, um, a clear case of workers in the middle being those such as in the informal sector, right, who don't have formal jobs uh, but are making ends meet, but in that case have seen their wage levels being eroded over time. So it's a very common phenomenon of workers in the middle of the distribution, common in the northern part of the world, uh, in industrialized countries where workers in the middle of the distribution are actually being squeezed. And what further steps are required to improve policy and turn around the decline in public safety, Gareth? Well, firstly, I think we need to rethink the kind of doctrine that we want our police to adhere to. What is our vision for the police? What exactly do we want them to be doing? They've been receiving conflicting uh, strategic frameworks and policy or directives and doctrines over the years. So it's been re, you know, re demilitarization, more towards community policing, then remilitarization. Um, you've got language in their strategic plan at the moment saying stamping the authority of the, of the state, but working in partnerships. Um, and it's not clear what police officers, you know, get different messages. And then you have this situation where the police largely due to the collapse of the management systems and the accountability mechanisms you don't know what you're going to get when you see a police officer. Are you going to get a trained professional who wants to help you and has a strong sense of public service? Or do you have a, a criminal in a uniform that is going to try and hit you up for a bribe or extort money out of you? And so we need to make sure that, the, that we have a very clear understanding that the fundamental success factor of any policing or law enforcement agency in a democracy is high levels of public credibility and trust. The research on this goes back many decades. But when people have high levels of trust in the police, they're less likely to break laws, regulations. They're more likely to listen to police officers and they're less likely to, yeah, to break laws and regulations when there are no police officers around because they believe that the state is acting in their interest. And they're also more likely to have greater levels of trust in other state institutions. Um, and I think that is what we haven't understood. So this remilitarization, this idea that you must be tough on crime, has just meant that we've got high levels of police brutality. We've got high levels of police corruption. Um, and that has seen a huge drop in people's trust in the police. Only around one quarter 
um, in the latest South African Social Attitudes survey from the Human Sciences Research Council show, have any level of trust in the police, which is a very worrying situation. And that's because of the way that the policing policy has been framed and the way the police see their work. So we need to understand that. And then it's about, once again, that's the making sure we have the right leadership in place to put in place the right training systems, recruitment systems, promotion, reward recognition, performance management, and accountability mechanisms to hold police accountable to very clear standards. A lot of that stuff's already there, but I think at the moment we have a very disparate leadership cohort of about six to 700 people, 200 generals, five to 600 brigadiers, and they're all, all pulling in different directions. Many of them should not be there because they're appointed for reasons that have nothing to do with policing. And I think that would be the first step. We've got to get the right leadership in place if you want to see the kind of institutional reforms needed to make sure that the 100 billion rand the police receive every year has a real impact on uh, crimes such as murder, robbery, corruption, and organized crime. And to date, we haven't seen that. We've seen the opposite. And lastly, Haroon, what interventions are required to lift the rate of economic growth and job creation in South Africa? So I think, Tabi, that's almost the, the subject of the book, right? And um, in many ways, across different areas, if I could give you a whistle-stop tour, everything from uh, whether it's governance in the public sector to crime, as we've heard, um, the labor market, local government, uh, the overarching politics of South Africa and political choices, if you like, uh, the fact that competition policy matters, key institutions like SARS uh, and uh, as a revenue generator together with how to deal with our debt position, all of that wrapped up in the central role of state-owned enterprises like ESCOM and Transnet. We've got all sorts of important sectoral chapters around agriculture, tourism, manufacturing, labor-intensive manufacturing in particular, BPOs and financial services. So if you like, we almost deal with cross-cutting issues, right, whether it's competition policy or the labor market or crime, uh, together with the central role of the state, namely state-owned enterprises, and then attached to that would be a set of sectoral suggestions, um, whether it's agriculture or tourism, or the, as the case may be. And in every single case, I would urge readers who don't have an appetite for 300 pages um, to actually go through each chapter. And at the end, we've crisply um, allowed the authors to identify three or four key better choices, right, that can be made in their, in their sort of um, area of expertise. And I think for me, that's, that's the real value add in terms of how we can push uh, growth forward in the country. That was Haroon Borat and Gareth Newham speaking to Krima Media's quality about better choices, ensuring South Africa's future.